past nine. Coming up, Mark Kermode will be joining me for a look at this week's movie releases. But first, it's time to see another side of our trusty film reviewer. We're revealing his hidden passion and also the significance of washboards and tea chests to the history of rock and roll. I knew there was a story behind that quiff. 50 years ago this July, something happened which changed the face of not just music, but popular culture forever. John Lennon and Paul McCartney met for the first time at a church fete where Lennon's band The Quarrymen were playing. The music The Quarrymen played was Skiffle, a lo-fi homegrown racket which was, in effect, the punk rock of the 50s, but which has since become associated with novelty songs like this. But Skiffle, despite its current reputation, is actually a wonderful thing, providing the missing link between American jug band blues and what we now think of as rock and roll. Now, I'll be honest with you, I love Skiffle. In fact, I've been playing double bass in Skiffle bands for the past 20 years, proudly flying the flag for this most disreputable of musical forms. Oh love, oh love, oh careless love. Although it was a uniquely British phenomenon, Skiffle has its roots in the music of the American South, in the anarchic jazz of New Orleans jug and washboard bands, and the folk blues of artists like Lead Belly. The man responsible for bringing it to the UK was British jazz legend Ken Collier. In the late 40s, there were a lot of British lads who, who wanted to play New Orleans jazz. One of these lads, a guy named Ken Collier, had this brilliant idea that he would go to New Orleans, where he found, not, you know, not the actual musicians, but he did find the sort of aged remnants of some of their, their, their sidemen, and he, and he sat in with them and he played with them. And um, he was put in jail in New Orleans, which did incredible for his kudos when he got back, you know, I was in jail in New Orleans, you know, if you can imagine. And he came back to, to, to England in in 52, and he got in with these musicians. Ken Collier's jazz men included banjo player Tony Donegan, later known as Lonnie, and upcoming band leader Chris Barber, who would entertain the crowd with raucous skiffle numbers in the intervals between jazz sets. They wanted to kind of educate the audience, so halfway through the gig, they kind of downed tools, put their brass instruments down, and they picked up acoustic guitars, and they played these old, these old three chord, sort of souped up blues songs. And gradually, this, among the young people, this aspect of it became more and more popular. And the word that, that Collier brought back from America with him for this type of music was skiffle. Indeed, it became so popular that when they needed some material to pack out a jazz album, they decided to cut a couple of skiffle tracks. And one of them was an up-tempo reworking of the Lead Belly standard Rock Island line. The appeal of Rock Island Line, with its rattling washboard and increasingly frenetic pace, boosted the album sales so much that in 1956 it was released as a single. The result was a hit which stayed in the UK Top 20 for months. The simplicity of Skiffle's three chord structure and the ease with which this new kind of music could be imitated led to hundreds of Skiffle groups being formed. Of course, the great appeal was that with Skiffle, your first stop wasn't the music shop, but the hardware store. If you had a tea chest and a broom handle, then you were off. The most basic of Skiffle instruments was the tea chest bass, a resonating box, a stick of wood and a piece of twine, or, if you're posh, a gut string to imitate the sound of a double bass. As for drums, if you can't afford an expensive kit, make do with one of these. Between them, the washboard and the tea chest bass formed the basis of the Skiffle sound. Domestic appliances turned to musical effect by proto-punk rockers. Not 
Lonnie Donegan became an inspiration to every aspiring teen musician in Britain. In fact, besides the Beatles, almost all of the 60s musical icons we revere today had, at one time or another, been in a skiffle group. Alan Clark and Graham Nash of the Hollies first started out in the skiffle outfit The Two Teens. Various Rolling Stones, including Mick Jagger, served their time at the skiffle coalface. As for Led Zepp, if it wasn't for Skiffle, then Jimmy Page may have taken a different career path entirely. What are your two names? Yours is? James Page and... David Haskell. Can you move on? What are you going to do when you leave school? Take up Skiffle? No, I want to do, uh, well, biological research. What Skiffle is, like it's boot camp for rock and roll. It's the thing that teaches, yeah. gets you into shape, you know, yeah. and, and anyone can do it. If you can find a teacher, yeah. if you can find a washboard, if you can find an acoustic yeah. guitar, anyone can have a bash at this, and you can get up and running. Yeah. To, to use it in modern parlance, Skiffle is, is viral. You know, you teach a kid free chords, he teaches his mates free chords, they teach their mates free chords, consequently everybody can do it. And that was the original um, uh, sort of punk, if you like, you know, learn three chords and now form a band. That's, that's exactly the punk ethic of 1977. From these humble homespun beginnings grew a musical movement that would give birth to rock and roll, although crucially, in its earliest electrified stages, this emergent rocking racket remained true to the first laws of skiffle. If you can't carry it, you can't play it. And no bloody drums. <laughs> Skiffle craze was actually fairly short-lived, as the genre's jug band roots gave way to the inevitable ascent of drum-pounding rock, more's the pity. The Quarrymen put away their washboard and became the Beatles, and Skiffle became little more than a footnote in Pop's evolution from blues to prog. Except, of course, for those die-hard enthusiasts who remember that if you hadn't had Skiffle, you'd never have had rock and roll. The reason why Skiffle is important is because it's the prehistory of British rock and roll. Everything that was cool about British rock in the 60s, everything from the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Small Faces, Led Zeppelin, all those guys learned to play music by playing Skiffle. It was open to everyone, it was utterly democratic, it was three chords and the truth. man of multitudinous talents, Mark Kermode, and here he is. How are you? I'm, I'm good. You play a mean harmonica. Well, as you know, the best thing about harmonica is it's a different harmonica for every key, so it is impossible to play a wrong note on a harmonica. You can always do a little sock when you mean to do a blow. Doesn't make any difference. Still, still not <laughs> quite the wrong note. Not quite out of key.